The Beast Lands is a super cool plane of existence that is literally the wild incarnate in its most true form. That means nature in all different sorts of environments like deserts and swamps and forests and jungles and animals of all kind, but not magical animals or monstrosity like things like chimeras and multi-headed creatures. No, no, no. This is the purest of nature. And if you've ever heard of the phrase, all dogs go to heaven, well, this is literally that heaven where all animals go whenever they die. So in this video, I'm taking you on a tour of what I'm calling the wildlands. I've made an entire PDF that we'll talk about later about this entire plane of existence and all the things inside it. Because I think the planes of existence are really cool. I've done a full video on Limbo that I'll link down in the description as well. But it's really scary as a dungeon master when you think about all the different planes of existence and what is there? How does it, how do I make it feel like this plane of existence? How do I make it cool to go to? What kind of stuff is going on there? Those are really intimidating things as a dungeon master if you want to put other planes of existence into your world. And if you're a player and this sounds cool, send this to your dungeon master and maybe you'll go to the wildlands. So first thing is to show you all the planes of existence and where the Beastlands fits in this whole cosmology situation of these planes. I also have other videos on the planes of existence and how they interconnect together. I'll link those down in the description as well. These are the rules as written planes of existence and where they are. But if you really dive into these planes and you really start to think about them, some of these places don't make sense and the beast lands is one of them. These planes are organized by the good planes or the positive planes on top and the negative or evil planes on the bottom. So that's fine. And beast lands would be in the top for sure. But then we have it separated by lawful and chaotic. Lawful towards the left, chaotic towards the right. So whenever I thought of the beast lands or I call it the wild lands, I think of survival of the fittest, wild beasts out in the wild, and that would be pretty chaotic. These beasts would not be following a strict code or structure in anything resembling law in that way. And I've slanted them and I switched them with Isgard. Simple little change, I just took those two locations and swapped. And now entering into the wildlands. Here's a picture to showcase the big picture of what's going on in this plane. This plane has three different layers to it and it's structured like a tree. How fitting for the wildlands. These three planes of existence are Tregala, Trux, and Ruteris. Coolest thing about them is the time of day. In Tregala, it is always daytime. The sun is directly above you all the time. Beating down on you is always massive daylight. And then we go down into Trux and it is always dusk. The sun is either setting or rising. Who knows? Because it never changes or moves. And you can probably guess what time of day it is down in Ruteris. It is nighttime darkness always there is the most dangerous layer of all of them. So time is really hard to tell in the Beastlands. Time still does pass. There's nothing crazy going on there, but it's really hard to sense what time of day it is because it's all it depends on what layer you're in and to fit into the structure of a tree and the bottom layer is in the roots of the tree dig into root terrace all of these roots impale the plane itself in this dark 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 place and then the tree extends up towards trucks and you see the sun can kind of crest through and that's where the kind of the little bit of light comes through and then at the very top tree canopy is tragala now as you can see there's lots of other things in different key locations and key npcs that are spread out through this entire thing but there's a lot to unpack in this pdf and you want to see the whole thing for yourself link for it's always down in the description but here we go all right now let's talk about the beasts of this plane every beast here is more intelligent than normal so something like a monkey or a pig or a dolphin or something that's really intelligent is pretty much going to be a fully sentient talking speaking creature just as smart as a normal human in the material plane and then we have things on the opposite end of the spectrum that have very little intelligence like a bug now have decent intelligence. They can't talk or reason or think and communicate like that, but they just have a lot more intelligence than you would expect a bug to have. And then things like cats and dogs and other animals will fall somewhere in the middle. Beasts in this plane are also a bit more empowered and feral. If you were to bring your simple house cat to this plane of the wildlands, it would jump down, become stronger and become more feral and just run off into the wilderness. But maybe if you go chase your cat down and kind of talk with them and reason with them, they'd have that higher intelligence and maybe calm it back down and kind of sink back up with you. So it's not like you'd lose your little pet, don't worry. But there is that feeling of the survival of the fittest that you feel while you're in this place. And a segue now from beasts to beast lords, every beast and every species of beast has a beast lord associated to it. There's a cat beast lord, a dog, a canine beast lord, bear beast lord, deer beast lord, etc. You get the idea. These are beast lords that are essentially the beast demigods of this plane. But here's one of the craziest thing about this plane. This plane dulls and maybe even nullifies the powers of gods. Any god that's trying to reach out and have a presence here in this plane is heavily, heavily weakened. Gods trying to reach out and impart their power in this plane through clerics and warlocks might have a hard time. Gods that come to this plane in person are literally weakened. And these beast lords within this plane aren't immune to these effects either. So these beast lords technically, yes, are gods, but they could be slain by a strong enough party because it's still a freaking 
in Beast Lord. You're going to have to have a pretty powerful party to be able to take that on. But it actually puts it within the realm of possibility. And there's been ploys and rumors between gods to lure them here to this plane to make them weaker and then kill them. Why is this? What's going on in this plane that caused gods themselves to be weakened? Well, the plane itself is a god. And this is where the term Mother Nature comes from. All of this, the entire tree that embodies this entire plane of existence is alive in some way. When you're traveling across any part of the plane, branches and leaves might move for you or against you to stop you. Maybe the plane helps you and as a creature is running towards you, the plane itself shifts and then it falls into some sort of trap that was laid there. Or was it laid there? Was that the plane doing that? You might see a calmly moving river and walk up to it as it speeds up and turns into a white rod or rapid because the plane doesn't want you to go to the other side of it. What's going on? I could go into this more, but then I'm trying to give you an overview of this whole thing. So one thing that's kind of adjacent to the presence of this god is the, is the concept of of you cannot hunt for the sake of sport and fun. You can't just go kill something and then not use its body for its parts, its fur, its pelt, its skin, its f eating its flesh. So now let's get into some of the homebrew mechanics that I've added into this world to make it feel. Because there's a difference between going there and it being this crazy nature thing with all these beasts. I want the mechanics at the core underneath the hood of this thing to feel like a wild place. So while in the wildlands, there's a passive effect called nature's revenge. If a beast is killed in the wildlands, the individual who struck the death blow must make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they contract lycanthropy in the flavor of the beast that they last killed. Now they'll have to make multiple saving throws before this thing sticks. And when they leave the plane, you can rule as a dungeon master that that effect would fade. But this also only kicks in if they don't honor the beast that they just killed. So as a dungeon master, if they land a killing blow on a beast and then they fight like three wolves or something and they kill them all and whatever, I would look for who landed the killing blow on each of those three wolves. And I would make note of it. They leave those wolves there and they just walk away and they continue on their adventure. Now, that's when I would ask for the wisdom saving throw nature itself turning against them. This would be a little puzzle that the players would have to figure out as they're going there and they would start to gain wolf-like appearances and then they, they maybe kill a different beast or a boar of some kind and then they start to look more like a boar. This doesn't have to be heavily mechanical and this can just be flavor things about them looking like their nose starts shifting and just purely physical appearances. Also, here's some cool things about spell effects in this land. Whenever you cast things like a fireball, it's not just a ball of fire. It is a phoenix that shoots out of your hand, flies and then flies itself into the ground and explodes. As a fiery phoenix. Maybe you cast an enchantment spell which looks like an illusion of a snake that swirls around, whispers into their ear. Then there's cool flavors to each school of magic, like conjuration. If you conjure and summon a beast here, it immediately takes over the effects of this feralness and wildness and is released because beasts can't be controlled here. And in the enhancement school, if you cast any sort of enhancement magic, beasts automatically succeed on their saving throw because you cannot control the minds of beasts within this plane. There's something cool for every single school of magic, but I gotta keep going here. Another thing with uh, we talked about a second ago with clerics and warlocks having maybe paladins too having their their divine and pact magics weakened. This would really depend on how much you and your players have a good relationship as far as how well you think they might be to their spells being reduced or them being limited in power in some way. Maybe they have limited spell slots. Maybe they have to make a check before every single uh, spell they cast. But either way, it'd be really cool to see how they handle that. And one of my solutions that I've thought of as a dungeon master is maybe they reach out to one of the beast lords in this plane and then they revitalize their magic and temporarily while in this plane of existence, they reach out to the, the bear beast lord and they get granted powers from them. Super cool. Maybe it sticks and maybe they switch patrons. Who knows? Now to talk about how you get to the wild lands and maybe even how you leave the wild lands. It's always a weird logistical thing every time I think of the planes of existence. So a couple ways to enter here. Now, when any beast dies in the material plane, any beast's go here. Any sort of beast instantly kind of their spirit comes here and they are arrive here to their beast lord. Each beast lord might use their subjects different in different ways, but they become part of that pack or that group of beasts. Here's a really cool part. If you're not a beast and you're a regular humanoid on the material plane and you worship or serve in some way a, a beast lord from this way or mother nature herself or probably different sects of druids and stuff, or if you just really, really love cats. Yes, that's right. The crazy cat lady will have a place to go in the afterlife in this whole big picture. But on a serious note, if you truly serve one of the gods here of this plane, one of the beast lords or mother nature themselves, um, you come here as a petitioner. So we'll use the cat god as an example for the crazy cat lady. They would go to this cat god. They would come here and they were, their spirit would be there and they would take the form. They're human. They were human in their real lives. They would take the form of a cat petitioner. They would now be able to travel with the other cats and stuff and be able to talk and communicate and they would be a petitioner. So while you're on this plane of existence, the party that is here, you might run 
into a petitioner. A petitioner is someone who was a human and now is here as a, a creature of some kind based on whatever they were worshiping. You wouldn't even be able to tell the difference between a petitioner cat and a normal cat, except for the petitioner cat would have the full on mind of a human, kind of like we talked about before. But then on that note, a monkey petitioner who would look the exact same and talk the exact same probably as a monkey from the higher intelligence. But maybe if you worship the god of spiders, you would find yourself down in Ruteris, in the dark, dark, dark lands of Ruteris. And that is where you would find your new home as a spider petitioner, serving now the spider queen. It doesn't have to be Loth or whatever. This is just a insectoid type of, very, very bad. It's a, one of the it's one of the crazy boss type things down in Ruteris. Nasty, scary place. Now, if you want to get here without dying in some way, there's also options you got. There are three ways to get here, starting with the hardest and going to the easiest. The hardest way is the, the planar rivers. There's planar rivers. There's the rivers that flow through all the outer planes, connecting them all together. We have uh, the, the whole big picture. And you can literally go across the river from one plane into the next. It's not as easy as it might sound. It's not just a simple little boat ride. You're traveling through crazy planes of existence. But to show that plane wheel again, you could travel from Limbo and take the planar rivers from Limbo into the Beastlands. And then you can keep going into Arborealis and all that kind of stuff as well. Again, we have to change some names there. The second way is Nexus, the city of gates, which is our renaming of Sigil, the city of doors. This place is like a central hub of the planes and has a portal that goes to each one of the planes. If you can get there, you can get anywhere. But all of that is hard and confusing. And how do you even get to those places, right? So I have implemented two ways to get there from the material plane that can be highly secretive and let your dungeon master come up with more of their own ways or keep these ways secret. First of these two ways on the material plane would be a nature-based way, which is going to be some sort of large, massive tree, some sort of mother tree, some sort of earth tree, like the earth tree. And it's this huge tree that has Arcturus to protect it. And at the base of this tree is a portal to the wildlands. Simple enough, that could be a whole adventure trying to even get to this place to even get into the wildlands in itself. That's super cool. And another ritual that we created here is some sort of great hunt, some sort of grand hunt. Now, I know the spirit of the planes is you're not allowed to hunt, but that's only if you don't use its resources. So what this is would be there's a great beast and these great beasts can exist all over the material plane in whatever way. But there is one great beast. This beast has such a strong connection to the wildlands and the beast lord of that wildlands that if killed, slain and performed a ritual using all of its parts, you have to take and respect this creature that you just slain. You have to use all of its parts to create weapons out of, to create armor and shields and weapons and, and, and tents and campsite and the things that provide for others. Something that lets this creature live on in a different way. Use the meat to feed villages and all this kind of stuff. Do all of these things and then with that, you would be able to open a portal and channel that energy, performing a certain type of ritual that only certain druids would know on this the, re the remaining parts of this beast to be able to get into the wildlands. So now another thing I'm going to try and get you guys real quick, because now you're here, you've seen what the beasts are like, what the gods are like, what the different things are going on and how magic works differently here. And then now how to even get here in the first place. Well, now you're here. What different things and locations are in the wildlands? So doing a quick flyby here, you have the Forbidden Plateau, and this is the location. Spoiler alert, top secret. Nobody knows this, etc. So this is something that people like wonder about. There's this plateau that goes up into the nobody can climb it. There's things that protect it. What's going you hear these these roars and deep, deep bellows coming from this place. What is up there? No one can get up there. No one knows. This is the the origin and location of dinosaurs and the the beasts of the, the the apex beasts in this way. This is where dinosaurs come from. I thought that was a super cool little twist on this. There's also the capital city called Tent Post, which is this massive place that has a bunch of tents and a bunch of it's the large grand city of the wildlands. There's a bunch of centaurs and stuff, and then there's also factions in here of lichen faction versus the centaur faction versus all these other cool factions that we have going on here to kind of the, or at at war in some ways of fighting for survival of the fittest. Huh? Huh? There's the arid waste, which is like a craggy wasteland type of situation. Um, then that's all those things that I just listed off is in the top layer of Tregala. Then in the second layer in trucks is Bondor's rest, which might be my favorite place. Uh, this is home to Bondor, which is the god of lycanthropy. And it's such a cool thing. It's just this like super chill bear werewolf type or, or werebear type guy. And he's just a, a place that parties and has basically camps and, and ro roast s'mores 
hours every day. But he's the protector and god of lycanthropy. It's a really cool little uh, mix of this. You know what it reminds me of? Is Baloo from the Jungle Book. I feel like that's what I would channel if I role played Bondor. They even have a grand fishing tournament that they host and the players can partake in this grand fishing tournament where they have to fish, but they can't use a fishing pole and they have to use their hands. It's a whole thing, it's cool. Then there's a city called Nestuary, which is between Trucks and Tregala, which is up in the canopies, which is where a bunch of bird people live. And there's they fly amongst the branches and little tree villages left on branches. Then down in Rue Terrace, there's something called the Fire Crystal Ravine, the Hissing Comb, and it's this hive of just these bugs and a bunch of nasty stuff. And another really cool thing I didn't want to leave out of this video is Stromhaus, which is the greater deity, which is the god of the cloud giants. Stromhaus resides in a flying cloud fortress that floats around the layers. He never touches down because he would get further weakened because of the effect that the gods have in this plane. So him being here, he is weakened, but he is at least not more weakened if he touches down and lands foot on this place. So he's, he floats around here, almost kind of work. Does he work with Mother Nature? Does he work with the other gods? Who knows? He's a cloud giant and he's amongst the clouds. And the clouds in this plane are also alive. They're called Maokai. And they're essentially the sentinels and, and uh, spies or observers of this plane. Who do they work for? Do they work for the cloud giant or do they work for Mother Nature herself? Who knows? But these clouds called Maokai control the weather and they control the winds and all this type of stuff. You can even communicate with them. There's just so many cool things to show you guys. I have the Beast Lords of the Wildlands. This is the table of the Beast Lords. We have Loxar, which is the Beast Lord of the Elephants. Vulpurin, which is the Beast Lord of the Foxes. Ursades, God of the Bears. You get the idea. This is the PDF that's linked down in the description. We have Beast Lord stat blocks. We have a whole, whole adventure hooks, different, uh, fully full flushed out with art, adventure hooks with different things, quests that you can go on while you're here. Tables and random encounter stuff for the different sites you can see different creature encounters you have and more so if you like all this stuff and want more patrons at certain reward tiers get pdfs every single month this is a great example of one of them this pdf is available during the month of march and then afterwards it will be available on my website all those links are always in the same spot thank you so much for supporting what i do here in whatever way that you do whether it be watching videos or supporting on patreon it helps me make things like this take time and development and take the team that i have and bring us all together to be able to create super awesome resources that we can all use to make our worlds that much better and take some of the burden of prepping game time and coming up with all this stuff off of those Dungeon Masters so we can truly have and tell some great stories. So until next time, stay creative. Think outside the box. Peace.